I genuinely do wonder if you're going to see some changes uh, because obviously what's what's happened isn't working. Um, one week on the O-line doesn't make – like one week of bad O-line play doesn't mean that – Actually, everyone's been right all year, and that's something that we're going to talk about a lot. And you never read the comment section today, where you know a lot of people are saying, "Oh, Sam, behind this O line, it's a terrible O line. It's a bad O line. If you only had a half decent O line, he does. They are definitively half decent, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't be better. And I will say this, Anthony. This is where I thought I'd start. In fact, I thought we'd still be listening to Rivera right now. But like one of the things that drives me nuts is like when people just take numbers and and throw them out completely out of context and try to make a point that the numbers don't actually make. Like, you got people talking about how bad Andrew Wiley is. Look, Wiley hasn't been good. I'm not, no one is, no one should be trying to tell you that Wiley's been good. But, like, he's given up some of the the highest number of pressures in the league. That's going to happen when your quarterback drops back more than any quarterback in the league. That's how totals work. Like, percentage-wise, he's middle of the pack. And, like, Sadiq Charles, oh, he's given up, you know, like the third most sacks amongst interior linemen. Well, on a bunch of those, Sam stepped up into Sadiq's guy, and Sadiq gets credited for the sack. Watch the tape. Know what you're watching. Don't just blindly look at totals numbers and think that that is actually, uh, you know, relevant in terms of how these guys are playing. And again, the O-line was bad on Sunday, and there's a ton of mental mistakes, and Charles was a big part of a lot of them. Gates was really bad on Sunday. Like, but there's no defending, uh, and it's not even defending. And that's the other thing, too, I think, that that really, like, where I'm kind of frustrated right now with a lot of the narrative play around the commanders, and it makes it really difficult to talk about, is you're defending, you're switching. No, I'm analyzing. If I tell you Sam Howell played bad on Sunday, it doesn't mean I gave up on Sam Howell. I don't have a stake. Like, I have, I have a position that I have a prediction. But, like, it's a moving target, um, you know, in terms of the actual data that we intake. And it's more important to, to take a look realistically at where we are than try to do some ridiculous forecasting moving forward. And this is kind of what I talked about last week when I when I was like, why is everyone obsessed with labeling Sam Howell as the guy or not right now? If you had to bet right now, I don't have to bet right now. And more importantly, they don't have to bet right now. There's 10 more games to go. And every single week we can say like, hey, if we had to make the decision today, would we X, Y, or Z? And to be honest with where we are right now, based off of Sunday and some of the other things that I've seen, I would not take quarterback high in the draft or if there's one that becomes available as a free agent off the board. I wouldn't just hand the job to Sam Howell next year. I would I don't feel like I need to draft someone. But the beauty is we have 10 more games to figure this stuff out. And so with that said, even though the offensive line is hasn't been until Sunday horrendous, if it can be better, you should do better. If Ricky Stromberg or Tyler Larson is going to be better than Nick Gates, play that guy. You don't know owe Nick Gates anything. And you know who, who would agree with that? Nick Gates. He signed his contract. He's going to get the money. You're not entitled to playing time. If Cornelius Lucas is a better right tackle than Andrew Wiley, which isn't an outrageous statement, um, then play Cornelius Lucas. Like, Wiley, you don't owe him anything. You signed him for a reason. But... Like you don't you don't owe these guys anything. You owe it to everybody to play the best players at each position. And if there are better options, then you should play them. And if Chris Paul comes in and this offensive line starts to gel and play better with Sadiq Charles out due to injury, even though Sadiq was really good earlier this season, hasn't been as good lately, then keep playing Chris Paul. Or if 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 Ricky Stromberg winds up playing there and he's better, then play Ricky Stromberg. Like, I'm not tied to anyone. The only thing I am tied to in the way I do this uh, in, in commenting and commentating on this team is I am tied to trying to actually accurately reflect what is happening. And they stunk, the offensive line, on, on Sunday. And they also did not get a lot of help from the quarterback. And that's why I maintain that the biggest reason they lost on Sunday was the quarterback. Um, but 
you have more options on the O line than the quarterback. It's that or Jacoby, and I don't. I, I think they're better off just trying to stick with Sam than going to Brissett. So that's from someone who likes Jacoby Brissett quite a bit. Um, so with that said, like everything should be on the table. And frankly, and this is the other thing too, like the hot story of the day is apparently at least one team has made a legitimate trade offer for Montez Sweat. If you lose on Sunday, you should take a trade offer. If you win on Sunday, you're 500. So one of the things that I I think is very silly about the way we talk about sports is we want to do everything right now, definitively including things that we don't actually have to do right now. 301 230 Zero nine eighty. Let's uh, let's start off with Marvin. Marvin, thanks for calling. You're on the Hoffman Show. Hey, Craig, how you doing? I'm good, Marvin. Yeah, hey, man. I wish I had more time because I I got like six billion things I like to tell you. First of all, brother, I'm gonna have to say everything you said about in last segment. I have to disagree with. I absolutely disagree with if you think this offensive line has any redeeming quality at all. I'm I'm, I'm looking at them and I'm saying you're talking about that. Stats, stats, stats. Bump stats. That's for analytic nerds. All you do is look with your eyes. This offensive line. But Marvin, no, stop, 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 stop. Stats are are just numerical representations of results. Like the score in the game is a stat. You realize that, right? Points scored is a stat. That's the only stat that matters, though. But the other stats (laughs) inform that stat. And, like, you also have to put into context, for instance, like, sacks is a stat, right? But just assigning blame based off sacks is pretty stupid unless you understand the context of the statistic, which is that traditionally sacks are actually a quarterback-driven stat, not an offensive line-driven stat. Where, and that is proven by the um, fact that over time, if you take bad, off, quote-unquote, bad offensive lines and you put a different quarterback behind them, the sack numbers change dramatically. Absolutely. They do. Because every player changes the game differently. They of just course. Do. If I put the best quarterback ever behind a bad offensive line, the bad quarterback might take a little hit, but he might boost up the offensive line. Of That's course. That's not the point right here. The point right here is what I'm trying to make is we have this quarterback and we have this line. Okay? And right now, I, with my eyes, I can see a bad offensive line and a quarterback who's learning who has his biggest fault. Sam, Sam Howell's biggest fault is he trusts what the play call is. He's reading deep to short every time, and he doesn't really have time. He should be Alex Smith and read short really quick and throw those little checks 100%. Down. But the truth, the truth is he's trusting his offensive line, and that's, a, that's just ridiculous because they're terrible. But no, but that's the thing is they're not terrible. They're average. Oh, oh and like God. this is this is the difference, Marvin, is like the conclusion is not the offensive line is terrible. The conclusion is oh. the offensive line is a bad fit for this quarterback and that was organizational malpractice. That's very different. Because if this same offensive line is in front of Patrick Mahomes, for instance, who is the exact opposite end of the spectrum on taking sacks than Sam Howell, they could win a Super Bowl. Like, that doesn't mean it's a bad offensive line. It means a bad fit with the quarterback and a bad fit potentially with how they're teaching the quarterback to operate. But considering this quarterback had this exact flaw coming out of college, like, it's just a bad fit. What they should have done is invested heavy in a great O-line, and they just said, eh, we'll take an average one, and they're giving him an average amount of time to throw. Again, Sunday's a bit of an outlier on this. Not a bit. Sunday's an outlier on the season. They stunk on Sunday. Um, and they, it was very specific situations. They were bad at passing off stunts. Like, there, there was bad at identifying pressure, blitzers. Some of that is also on the quarterback, by the way. But that doesn't all of a sudden make them bad. They're giving him time to throw. He's not using it well. Can I throw one more thing out there? Sure. I'll agree with some of the things you just said because, you know, it is a bad fit. But I'm with my eyes. I don't trust any of these offensive linemen. I just think they're all jagged. They're just average. And to right. me, below average on maybe two or three spots. But that being said, I want to throw this out there because a lot of people have never mentioned it. This is about Eric Bieniemy and just the situation that he happens to be in. I don't think people are putting enough weight on this. But he came in here with no other offense. Okay, and he has this one chance to really show what he can do. So there's pressure on him to basically push the envelope, even though that might not be what's best for his players right now. And I'm saying I don't think anybody's mentioned that on any show or anything that I've heard. 
that he might be pushing it because this is his one shot. He's had 15 head coaching interviews, and nobody gave him a shot. He had to dump the Kansas City Chiefs for the Washington Commanders. Think about that. And they, no, still, I know. Had, and they still had Dan Snyder as the owner when he does this. So his, his pushing this envelope might not be the best thing for his quarterback because this is his one shot. This might be his only shot of ever showing anybody he has the where to be an offensive coordinator and coach. I, and that's what he's wanted to be for the last three and a half years. I hear you, Marvin, on that. And what I would say is that is a terrible miscalculation by bien because the way to win and the way to get the next job is to be successful in this one, not to chase stats to go all the way back to the start of your call. Like Sam Howell I, leading the league in passing, if he's sacked a, a record number of times and the commanders go win six games, is not going to get Eric bien a job. Eric bien coming with an actual good game plan for this particular set of personnel – and winning games is going to get him the job that he wants. I'm not saying he's doing that, but I'm worried yeah. that no, I, he, hasn't, he hasn't really changed anything. He's still dropping him back as many times he did the first time he got sacked six or eight times. So it's like, you know, the proof is in what are you actually doing to actually mitigate these terrible, terrible, like, circumstances of having an average offensive line and a quarterback who takes way too many sacks. Ah, that's it, Marvin. So, I heard that. Average offensive line. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, hey, man, I, I'm going to let you run because we got a bunch of other calls, but I appreciate the call a lot. Um, and again, like, I think this is the thing. Like, a lot of people actually who think they, like, violently disagree with me don't really disagree with a lot of stuff. It's just putting the facts in the right perspective. Like, I'm not telling you your eyes are lying and this offensive line is awesome. What I'm telling you is, is that if an offensive line is on average, and I know everyone's like, he had 2.2 seconds to throw on Sunday. Yeah, Sunday was bad. And that number was pulled down dramatically by, for instance, a nickel blitz where Sam gets sacked, I think, in less than a second. That's Sam's fault because he didn't identify the blitzer properly. So, like, even if you take that out, the number's not going to be good. And the other five sacks are on the offensive line. But there's also more to offensive line play than just pressure or just sacks there's pressures there's okay on the plays where they're not pressure how good is the pocket how well does the quarterback move within the pocket to make the most of it and there's a lot of stuff in those more nuanced areas that Sam hasn't really been great at so far this season and it gives you questions like okay when is that stuff going to start to get better because you're willing to live with some of it but I think on a larger level to the part that like Marvin and I definitely sounds like we agree on is this line, and I, I said this earlier this week, I've said this multiple times this season, I know that not everyone listens to every segment of every show, especially when I do three hours of radio, five days a week, and three podcasts. If you listen to everything we do, God bless you, but also please go touch grass. That is a lot of me. Um, I don't even listen to that much of me, and the words are coming out of my mouth into my own headphones. What? Anthony, how much of the show do you listen to? Uh, the three hours that I'm here. Okay, that's that's the correct answer. Good job. Any other answer would have gotten you fired immediately. I'm just kidding. I don't have that power. The point is, like, the the problem is structural. It's not that this O-line is bad. PFF has them based off of their film breakdowns and their numbers and the combination of those things coming together as a top 10 line. And by the way, if you go watch a lot of other, like that's another thing. I think a lot of people don't actually watch the rest of the league. Um, very often. This is not a terrible league worst offensive line. It is a tremendously bad fit to be average and inexperienced, by the way, with a young quarterback who holds the ball at criminally long intervals. Uh, 301-230-0980. Let's go to Aaron. Aaron, thanks for calling. You're on the Hoffman Show. Man, thanks for taking my call. But, I, you know, I, I wholeheartedly disagree with you. I think I heard you say that we, we should have invested more in the offensive line in the draft. So I literally I, just I, said that four seconds ago. No, 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 no. No, I said that's what I heard you say. That's what I'm saying to you. So my question to you is, you think that this offensive line would have been better with Heineke at quarterback? You know, when I look at, like Marvin was saying with my eyes, this guy has no time to pass the ball. Listen to this. Think about this. When's the last time you've seen a receiver running wide open? Those two passes that he threw the, uh, to, to McLaurin, 
was McLaurin open? Well, maybe in the NFL, according to a professional, he was open. But in my eyes, he was not open. And he dropped that ball. Right Aaron, do you hear there. yourself? So, like, ser- uh, a serious yeah. question. Do you hear yourself? To, according to NFL professionals, they said one thing, but I think something else. So you know better than the NFL professionals. Listen, these guys are just paid to do a job. Not only is it just that. Aaron, what do you do line, for a living? I'm retired. What I'm did retired. you do for a living? I'm, I'm 60, construction. I'm okay. 61 years old. So you want me to come to your forever. construction site and be like, I don't know. I don't think that fits together. You're the professional, but I don't know. I'm a professional fan. And not only are we losing who pays you? because of the offensive who pay, line. Uh, who we, pays listen, you? Who pays you? We, we, no, I'm retired. I'm no, retired. no, no. But you're a professional fan. You as professional means you get paid to do it. Because oh, no that's one, a great no gig, and I want to know where to sign up. No hey, let me, let me ask you one question. What defense hasn't run rush off over our, our, our offensive line? Which defense has not this year? Uh, Which defense has not? That, th- <laughs> Aaron, what you what? see as running, quote-unquote, rough shot over the offensive line prior to Sunday mm-hmm. against the Giants was the quarterback holding the ball for longer than is reasonable to ask an NFL <laughs> offensive line to block a, a NFL defensive line. There is a standard that? that this line has met. He's, Go ahead. He's looking long and he's neglecting the short pass. What I'm saying to you is no to key. prove my point, we, we don't even have wide receivers running yes, they wide do. open. They, because who will win? Yeah, the, the, the check downs, yes. And he's missing the check downs because right, he Aaron, looks long. I, just, and I then, can't. My head's it twisted in a circle. He should look short. But the checkdowns, that like, this is the problem. I'm, Anthony, am I doing a bad job here? Am I being mean to people? Pull me back if I'm about to get myself in trouble. Uh, I don't think you should continue with your thought. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to wrap this up as nicely as I can. Well, well, I'm happy to take more calls, um, and I'm trying to keep it together here. But I would like for the people that call in to be to make sense because you can't have it all ways. You can't call me and tell me the O-line stinks. And when I say, actually, they're doing the thing that they're supposed to do and then start talking about blaming the quarterback and then yell at me when I say it's the quarterback's fault. Because that's literally what just happened. Oh, there's no one open. He's got the checkdowns. Yeah, that's one. Most Like some of these, what you think are checkdowns are actually the play design. Like a hitch is not a checkdown. You hit it quickly. He's got sit routes over the ball. He doesn't throw them. There's a concept they run all the time called bow. It's a five-yard sit, and there's a deep dig behind it. And Sam has a nasty habit of looking at the dig for too long when the sit route is wide open. And I could show you a half dozen plays on film this year where that happens. So certain plays are designed certain ways. Ultimately, the quarterback has to understand the timing. And part of the timing is getting through your progression in a timely manner to hit the open receiver's when they come open. Because NFL guys don't, especially on shorter routes, don't run, quote-unquote, wide open. That's not how plays are designed because defenses are too good. What happens is you, for instance, if there's a cover three situation, so three deep defenders, four underneath defenders, what will happen is, let's say a receiver comes uh, from, there's two receivers to the right side, let's take the outside receiver, kind of runs diagonal and then hooks up in between two of the underneath players. So he said three deep, four underneath. He'll go in the middle. Well, as soon as the quarterback looks at him to throw the ball, those two defenders that he's sitting in the middle of are going to collapse down on him. The ball already needs to be there. And when you're late, you either get no opportunity for run after catch or you get incompletions or interceptions. And that is what is happening on a regular basis with a lot of the shorter stuff because Sam looks too far down the field. That can pay off because he also has one of the highest depth of target averages in the league. He's one of the best in the league at pushing the ball down the field, but at the expense of functioning a functioning offense down in and down out. Sunday's again, an aberration. Sunday, the offensive line had a ton of missed assignments. It was really bad. And I do think Sam got shell-shocked. He didn't help himself out, but they didn't help him either. And I don't think EB adjusted fast enough. All those things are true. But if you've got 
three, three and a half seconds to throw in the league, that's enough time. You have to make the throws. And eventually you have to just go, there is a line of NFL quarterbacking, and in certain areas, he's not hitting it. That's an inarguable reality. And so if you call in and you try to make an argument that actually isn't there, you're going to wind up talking yourself in circles. So let's just not, let's skip that part, maybe, maybe, or let's keep doing it. Uh, We have some more calls. Uh, Alfonso, Billy, Devon, we'll get to you guys and uh, we'll bump the West interview back. That's the beauty of the fact that we taped it at Media Day. Uh, We'll find space for it in the show. 301-230-0980, the Ace Law listener line. If you're in a wreck, Ace Law helps you get a check. Call 8888-ACE-LAW. More of your calls next. Back to the phones we go. Uh, let's pick it up with Billy from Miami. Listen on the Odyssey app. Billy, appreciate you. Thanks for holding through the break. Uh, go ahead. You're on the Hoffman Show. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. We got you loud and clear. Great. Awesome. I might be calling into the wrong discussion because I'm calling in support of Sam Powell. <laughs> but, I've been wa- <laughs> but I've been wanting to bring this up since last week, even before the loss of the Giants, when Sam was already getting criticized. And I really appreciate you continuing to say, let's make this year productive by using the, the only way we can make this year productive as of now, by using the final 10 games, to observe Sam Howell. That's the best thing we can do. So, you know, I'd like to make three quick points. All right, shoot. First of all, um, you know, he's shown enough potential. And we continue to say this, and I'm happy to hear that the listeners seem to collectively agree with this. Uh, he's a young quarterback, no protection, a new offensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I just think back to even Peyton Manning's first year. I'm not, of course, I'm not saying he's Peyton Manning, but, right, but you he know, young was quarterbacks awful. struggle. Yeah. The second thing is, I, I, I've sort of already said it, you've said it, this year in my mind is a bit of a throwaway. So the best thing we can do is make an astute decision on how. And that would be a big thing if we can make that decision. You know, throwing someone else in, you know, into the mix just to win a couple games and get a couple more touchdowns is completely unproductive for immediate results for me. And then, and then finally, I'm going to really stir the pot. And this is just for fun. Because uh, all day I've been hearing the radio show hosts talk about Kirk Cousins and how mm-hmm. great he is and how great it would be back to get him back here and how he won the Monday night game. I think it was Monday night. Yeah. You know, and as of now, I would take Sam Howell over Kirk. And the reason I'm saying that is because to me, Kirk is a known commodity, right? I, Kirk has incredible talent. And to me, he's very similar to Tony Romo, who had incredible talent, had all the stats, broke all the records, but he never finished. And, you know, unlike a Brett, you know, a Brett Favre, who probably didn't have as much talent, or even a Brad Johnson, you know, there's just a winning mentality sometimes or people who can win. And so yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to make this a discussion about Kirk, yeah. but I do want to say that I think Sam has shown a lot of poise and he's a real leader. And I, I think that says a lot for the locker room. Yeah. All right, Billy, thanks for the call. I'm going to let you, I'm going to respond to your stuff real quick on air. First, I'm not going to let it slide. You said no protection. He doesn't have no protection. He doesn't have optimal protection. And there's a difference there. Um, I do agree though, with your larger point that like letting Sam finish out the season is the clear and obvious correct choice unless it gets to a point where you're just like he can't pre- like if he keeps taking sacks at this rate it might be in his best interest to let him sit the final six or so games to just be like dude like if this is if this really is this unfixable we can try again next year and you let the next regime figure it out um and that's that's probably the best thing for sam so he doesn't wind up you know a la patrick ramsey a la david carr some of these really talented young quarterbacks who you know the the way he's bad, I think, is is dangerous because he has shown a lot of potential. Because his good is exceptionally good. Um, it's just how do you how do you limit this thing? As far as Kirk goes, if you, yeah, Sam now versus Kirk now, like Kirk's very expensive. He's older, whatever. And you're not like if you want to try to win a Super Bowl, then in the next two years, Kirk's the correct answer. Um, but I think it also goes back to I hope the discussion is about letting Kirk go years ago, not anything now i don't want to get sidetracked with a kirk discussion uh let's go to let's see uh let's go to alfonso uh alfonso thanks for calling you're on the hoffman show hey thanks for taking my call you got it i I just i couldn't i couldn't agree more with you about sam howe and people making excuses as a young quarterback but he had the same problem 
his junior year, his senior year in college, where he wasn't in the new offense, had a different offensive line. Uh, when I watch him play, I can say one, two, three, four, <laughs> he still has the ball. Right. <laughs> he still has the ball. Yeah. And not only that, it's like when you're boxing, if you see a punch come, you got to move your head before you get hit. But he, his reaction time when he sees the pressure is too slow. Like he processes too slow. And I don't think it's something that's going to be, be able to be fixed because, again, this is his first year playing, but this is his second year in the NFL. He saw the quarterbacks last year who held the ball too long, and he saw what happened. I'm quite sure they, they preached it in the meetings last last year with, the, with those quarterbacks. He heard that. For sure. He's getting sacked every game. Every game he's getting sacked consistently five times a game. I think at least 75% of the sacks are on him. Yeah, no, I mean, statistically, that is that is accurate, Alfonso. Thanks for the call. Uh, much appreciated. And, yeah, I mean, Sam also does this thing that, I mean, he didn't have time this weekend. Again, the line this weekend was the exception uh, and how bad they were. Uh, but, like, he'll get to the top of his drop and just kind of sit there. And you're like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and another area where Sam is not very good yet, um, and hopefully this is a yet. And, again, like, all I can say is hopefully this is a yet. Um, this is not me saying he will be bad at this forever. It's not me saying he's definitely going to fix it. Is he doesn't move within the pocket well. Like, there are times where better pocket movers, you talk about, oh, Tom Brady couldn't do anything behind this line. Yeah, he could. He'd move. And Tom Brady isn't exactly Mr. Mobility. Tom Brady's different. Like, his movement is different than Michael Vick's. But Brady had this ability to just slide a little bit in the pocket, let a uh, blitzer go by or a, a D lineman go by, and then keep his base and make a throw. And Sam has shown next to no ability to do that. He has shown some great escapability at times, the last play of the game where he winds up throwing to Jahan who drops it. Um, but there's there's plenty of other examples where a little slot like and sometimes he vacates clean pockets too like his pocket presence is bad um and i hate to say it because that doesn't bring me joy but like that's the analysis uh we'll keep going with the calls through the rest of the hour let's uh let's get kenny in real quick before we go to break though uh kenny thanks for calling you're on the hoffman show kenny all right, tell you what, we're up against the break anyway. I'm going to put Kenny back on hold. Anthony, why don't you double-check with Kenny uh, off the air? We'll take a quick look at what's trending. I got four calls. I'm going to try to get to all of them next here on the Team 980. <laughs> try our guy Kenny again. Kenny, uh, hopefully we got you this time. Thanks for calling. You were on the Hoffman Show. Hey, thanks for taking my call. You got it. Um, First-time caller. Appreciate uh, it. First-time listener, man, and I heard you and – Breath of fresh air, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, actually know what you're talking about. I played collegiate football. I was a former domestic stag. You know what you're talking about. And um, I echo everything you said. Your exact sentiment, echo it. And one thing I noticed with Sam, um, just to make a point, I want to hear your take on this. Sure. One thing I noticed with him, um, and sports is real simplistic, but this – he takes a lot of frivolous momentum sacks. And what I mean by that is he'll hold the ball and give a team a sack instead of just throwing it away, taking a punt. And what that does, not only is the crowd get to erupt, and that excites the defense, and it's almost like they're smelling blood. It's, it, and it's a frivolous sack. It's like you just took that sack, just throw it away. It's like you took it for no reason. And that's – creating more pressure and that's creating more havoc on you and you're just adding that on other than every point that you touch i wholeheartedly agree um and that's why i think with eb i think he's getting uh not a fair shake um but i don't want to take it down to you know another point on that yeah um well can me the expectations like go ahead i was just gonna say we got a bunch of calls so i appreciate that point first of all thank you for the kind words and appreciate having you on board as a listener hopefully uh, that continues. I'm going to let you go now, um, but call back anytime. Um, I just want to make sure that we're, we're kind to everybody that, that's waiting here. Um, I think it's a really great point about kind of the, the, the way he phrased that, like the frivolous sack, right? A sack is better than a turnover, but you know what's better than not a sack? Or better than a sack? Not a sack. An incompletion, for instance. And that, I think, goes to Sam's pocket presence. There are times where his clock goes off, and he's like, I got to do something. And instead of just a subtle slide in the pocket or taking a look around and dropping his head for a, a quarter of a second to be like, oh, I'm good. 
he tries to run. And this is why, for instance, Sadiq Charles, who, again, I'm not telling you is playing awesome ball, but he's not playing as bad as his sack statistic is because how many times has Sam tried to step up through the the A gap of the pocket or the B gap um, on either side of Sadiq and had Sadiq's man just grabs him and brings him down? A ton. I would say like half or more of the sacks that Sadiq has quote-unquote given up this year have been Sam trying to vacate the pocket and often... It's been an, a clean pocket. And so when people talk about the offensive line play, when, when I tell you it's average or it's better than you think, like that's part of it. A quarterback vacating a clean pocket causes pressure. And I think sometimes that is happening with Sam because he's not great at moving around in the pocket. Um, and we'll get to this later in Never Read the Comments. But like one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier this week was I would be begging Sam to go spend time with Drew Brees this offseason. Be like, how did you do this at this height? And a commenter on YouTube made a great point that I think it was 11 times in Drew Brees' career with the Saints in 20 years or 14 years, whatever it was, that he had Pro Bowl-level guards in front of him. And that's the thing. is like Sadiq might be at playing average NFL guard ball, but for a quarterback like this, you need elite play, and it's a bad matchup. Um, but Sam could also be elevating those guys if he'd stop running into sacks. Uh, let's go to Devon. Devon, you've been holding a long time. Much appreciated. Thanks for doing so. You're on the Hoffman Show. What's up? What's up, Kurt? What's up, Devon? I'm good. Uh, like, 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 uh, my boy, my boy knows that I listen to you guys all the time, and I do appreciate your take. You're very intelligent, and you really take pride in what you do. Honestly speaking, I listen to – I'm a driver, so I listen to nothing but 980 and 106 and 7. We appreciate that. And, of course, that. B, Mitch, and Finley, and your show is my favorite too. But I had a whole bunch of stuff to say. <laughs> but <laughs> listening to you, you really broke everything down. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it leaves me just with some questions because I really feel that you're in-depth and, you're, and you're, you're very knowledgeable and intelligent about what you're talking about. So my question is this, right? Okay. We all listen to the pressers every week, right? Mm-hmm. And I haven't heard anybody speak on this part. You, It's clear, like one of the callers said, it does look like Sam doesn't have time when we're sitting on our couch watching the game. Right. And But the sacks are adding up. But when you broke it down and you're like, listen, like three seconds, and then you're, I, can, I do see the thing that you're saying too. So it's like, okay, it's a mixture Outside of this last game, all his sacks besides one was on the line. But typically out of these seven games, it's like one. if he got sacked five times, it's three on him and two on the line, and then one, sure. the receiver's not getting over. Yep. My question is this, uh, mm-hmm. Craig, and i take it off because I know you're up against a hard break or whatever. Yeah. E.B. always states that what he loves about Sam Howe is that he does not repeat the same thing. <laughs> but it sounds like – what Craig is speaking on is that he's he's doing the same things. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just confused. It's like, don't tell, don't please don't be a Ron 2.0 and like <laughs> saying all the good things, but it's really not that. And also one of the last call, last thing, Craig, the one of the last yeah. callers, I think he is. I, he made a good point. Is he re, Is he? That's a question to you. Is he reading deep and then reading his check down? Is that how EB wants him to do? Like it's confusing because that's what it looks like he's doing. He looks like he's trying to get a big play, but he's missing his check down. And it's kind of how do you, like why would you do that if you're continuously getting sacked? Wouldn't your wouldn't your switch flip and say forget the deep route? I'm looking for all the check downs first. <laughs> you would so think so, Devon. Confusing, man. Yeah, you would think Thank so. You, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate the, uh, you listening with the frequency you do and the kind words. And uh, you know, we'll we'll make sure they get back to B. Mitch and Finley too. Um, a lot of good stuff there. A lot of questions. I'm gonna try to answer them uh, real quick before the break. So first and foremost, Eb at the podium is. He's a filibusterer, is what I would say. He's a guy that says a lot of stuff and doesn't really say a lot. Like, there's a lot of words, it fills a lot of time, and there's not a lot of substance to it. And also, he knows to not throw his guys under the bus. 
Um, and I think early on, Sam wasn't repeating the same mistakes. I think the problem is, and why I think some of the, the tone of the conversation around him has changed in the evaluation process is some of the stuff that earlier in the season, it seemed like, okay, he makes a mistake once and he learns. He does it again. And and I think a lot of the mistakes he hasn't repeated, like some of the the sack fumble mistake that he made against Arizona. He, like He's been better with his ball security. He hasn't tried to escape out of the back of the pocket like he did in that play. Like there are certain things that he did correct, and you're like, oh, he's got it now. The timing and feel for the pocket is like an innate quarterback ability. And I, I some of it is fixable, but some of it clearly is not. And I, I don't like that is the mistake he keeps repeating. And I think part of that is going back to like the way Kenny said it. Uh, the, the caller before Devon is like the processing speed doesn't seem to be up to NFL speed. And so I don't want to speak in too much generalities because there are plays that are read short to long. There are plays where you're not really reading like long to short or short to long. You're like, where's that defense? Where's the safety? Where's the corner? If he's up, I throw deep. If he's deep, I throw short. And, like, do you make that decision fast enough? Or if he's midpointing the route, do you get to number three? And, like, if you stick on each route a half a second too long, well, that adds up quickly when we're talking about somewhere between two and a half and three and a half seconds to throw. Like, that's a massive percentage of time. And to go back to something I said way earlier in the hour, the way these plays are designed aren't necessarily to get guys to run scotch-free wide open. The, the NFL has, defenses are too good. They're to get a guy in a window at a certain time where he's going to flash open, the ball arrives, and then he, that window's probably going to close. And so if you spend too much time on read number one, by the time you get to two, it should have been open, but it's, he, the window's already closed. Either the receiver got too far into the route, couldn't throttle it down, or wasn't supposed to based off how it's coached because the ball should have been there, or a defender has had time to get back into the route. Like the, These things get very complicated. Like I would love, honestly, Anthony, like we should pitch this. I don't, know, I don't know if our bosses would go for it. How much do you think we could sell tickets for for a film session where me and Logan sit there with a clicker for 90 minutes and go through tape? You think we could make money off that? <laughs> A little something, something. I'm just whoring Logan out. Can I say that on the radio? Uh, that I don't know. I hope so. Um, I think we're fine. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm abusing Logan's skills. I'll put it that way. But I know, I know enough that I, we could do it too. It just would be significantly better with Logan. Um, but where you just go, like, because this thing happened first, these four other things happen, and that's every single play in this league that's how thin the margins are and so that uh, this is why I try to stay away from sweeping generalities as often as I can and if I make them it's encapsulating a lot of finer details that some of which are interesting and good to talk about on the radio and some are frankly boring and that's why we get super nitty-gritty on the podcast we do however take some of that podcast and play it on the radio and that is what we're going to do next. So if you want more detail and Logan's thoughts, speaking of, that was an unplanned, excellent transition, Anthony. Uh, Logan's thoughts on the game on Sunday. Stay tuned because we have a take command snippet for you next. You're on the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and always live on the free Odyssey app. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.